Hello and welcome to Seahawk Scouting. My name is Brandon, and I do appreciate you as ever for tuning on in. I know I've been away for a little bit of time, but that's just to give me a chance to recharge the batteries here for this marathon season that's upcoming. And as well as I wanted to get a little bit of an overview look at these prospects in this next upcoming draft, merely now only nine months away. And when I look at this draft, I'm going to look through it with a lens and focus towards who the Seattle Seahawks could potentially be drafting, the positions of need, because many teams out there will tell you that we draft for the best player available. That's pretty fancy general manager talk is what that is, because the brass tax bottom line of this is when you look at general manager after general manager, team after team throughout the league, they always lean towards drafting towards the needs of their team. It would be great if you could be sitting in that position like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were this past offseason where they didn't lose one free agent. So it was really all, literally about drafting the best player available because they basically had a free draft. There were no positions of really any true need. Our Seahawks are not quite in the same position. They stand with a few needs already as you look out onto the horizon. Though this past offseason I think has been Overall, fairly successful. Uh, they've set up the pieces on the board as, as well as I think you could ask for a team that came into this offseason 24th in cap space and only sitting on three draft picks. But with that said, they are going to have some needs for next year because they are sitting on a lot of one-year deals as it stands. So right tackle, tight end, running back, potentially linebacker, and even, I will believe here, cornerback. Now, the Seahawks did just draft Trey Brown in the fourth round of this past draft, a pick that went outside of their normal prototype, and they do have a good collection of corners for this upcoming season, at least decent bodies to put out there. There's no true stars in the mix. But with that said, there's a lot of guys on one-year deals. DJ Reed, Akilia Witherspoon, Trey Flowers. So even though you picked Trey Brown last year, there's still a high likelihood that you're going to look to picking now another cornerback in this upcoming draft. The thing that stands out about the Seahawks over the course of the last 10 years in drafting under the John Schneider and Coach Carroll era is that they do not draft cornerbacks highly. They've taken a guy like Earl Thomas as safety, number 12 overall in the first round, but they've never taken a cornerback in the first round. And indeed, they've never actually taken a cornerback in the second round. And if you really want to get down to uh, the nitty-gritty on this one, you have to go all the way back to them picking Shaquille Griffin in the third round But that was even at the very back end of the third round. It was almost a de facto fourth round pick in itself. You can make the argument a little bit that Coach Carroll has acknowledged in this recent behavior in drafting cornerbacks that it's not really all that important to get the top line guys. This is probably a little bit to do with the fact that the Seattle Seahawks play so much zone, so much cover three. And so for Carroll, it seems like, why should I buy top shelf prices for a guy that I'm not going to utilize in that manner? I'm not going to ask him to travel with a receiver or be sticky in man-on-man coverage. So I'll go for the guy that can just get it done, keep things clean over the top, and maybe occasionally make a play, make a pick. That could be the case again this season, no doubt about it. But when you do look at this draft, there aren't a lot of cornerbacks that necessarily sit into exactly the same type of prototype build that we saw in last year's draft. And Seattle may be pushed at a point at that time of maybe picking a guy who they're a little desperate to fill in as an instant starter. And you can be more reliant on a guy that you're picking higher to do that than you can maybe a third rounder. Though Seattle has done that before and they're not hesitant to do that either. With that said, the guy that's going to jump out to me right out the gate, who I just sort of gravitated towards here, high air, Elam. I hope I got that first name right. We'll certainly get it right by the end of the season. He's a kid out of Florida, a fantastic corner out of Florida. The thing that anybody here who's watched this channel knows, knows that I like pedigree. I like roots that go back into college. I like roots that go to the NFL. And when you look at Elam, he had a father who played in the pros a little bit. He had a guy, Matt Elam, uh, an uncle who was a late first round pick. I think he was taken 32nd overall in the first round. Both of those two guys are safeties, which is interesting. So that's a little bit of the background of their safeties, but he actually plays corner. And he does bring a little bit of a safety mentality at play here to playing the corner position. What I like about him is he's 6'2". Big, long, and very physical. When you look at a Seattle Seahawks corner, the first thing that comes to mind for the the fan that's looked kind of deeply into this type of thing is that they like the six-foot-and-up cornerbacks. It seems the bigger, the better. 
And while this is true, they have in recent years a little bit gravitated away from that. When you look at recent picks like Ugo Amadi and last year's Trey Brown, both guys below, uh, well below six feet tall, I still think it is something that Coach Carroll values. And But as kind of a second a second frame to build on that, go beyond just the six-foot build, there also is sort of just a general feistiness, competitiveness, almost you could say a playing with anger type mentality that a Seattle Seahawks corner has to have. Brandon Browner had it. Richard Sherman had it. And certainly it's been, I think, a little bit missing in this defense at times. It's a thing that's maybe nice to have and hard to find, but when you got it and then you pair it up with the rest of a defense that's physical, that's nasty, that is, that is very happy to tackle you, very happy to come up and hit, now you've got a full assemblage of a defense coming at you downhill all game long, and that can wear an offense out. That can wear specifically skill position players out. Elam is that prototypical mold. He does have that dog in him. It's, it almost has taken sort of a rejuvenation of those old school Seahawk corner mindsets back into the secondary to remember what it was. DJ Reed, when he came on the scene halfway into the year last year, showed it. He went, oh man, yeah, this has been missing. And Ugo Amadi's got it in the slot. And likewise, Ka'ari Elam has it. You just know it when you see it. That extra willingness to fight off of blocks, that missile-like approach coming downhill, throwing his body at a ball carrier, taking him off his feet instantaneously. He's just got it in him. And the, the key defining trait to him, the reason I called him the moment of truth mangler, is because even though he doesn't have the greatest of ball skills, he has excellent anticipatory timing. So when that ball is coming in, he knows right when it's going to arrive. And when it's going to arrive, he's going to whip out that Sugar Ray Robinson 15 punches in one and a half seconds, and there's no way you're going to catch that football. It's not necessarily the most beautiful of technique, but this is why at the end of the day, football is sometimes called a man's sport. And sometimes it's not always just about technique or great fundamentals, but one man imposing his will on another. And what I like about Kari Elam right out the gate is he attempts to impose his will on the other player game after game. Got a quite a bit of footage to look through with this guy. We're not going to look through all the game footage a lot. We're going to go kind of game by game through because not a lot of corners were quarterbacks were willing to test him. But with that said, what I saw I liked, and I think you're going to like it too. So let's take a look at what's Mr. Elam second generation has to offer. All right, let's take our first look here at Kyer Elam. And full disclosure, there's going to be times in this video I'm going to call him correctly Kyer, and other times I might call him Kyari. I am working on the pronunciation on this one. I don't know why it's giving me troubles, but it is. Anyway, first thing we like to do, you know how I like to do it here, and that's going to be looking at the highlight package. Let's get a feel for what our guy has to offer. And the thing I think that's going to stand out to you in this highlight package is that Elam is a really good tackler. He comes up. He comes up with force, with violence. We're showing him uh, making an interception here, some plays on the ball. That's something that he has a little bit to his game on, but it's not necessarily his main forte or main first couple of fortes. But with that said, you see him do a lot of this. Come up, get low, take the man right off his feet. Here he's with Devontae Smith in the open field. Nice tackle there, running step for step. That right there is a little bit more of what you're going to tend to see a little bit here. And you know me, I'm going to go back a little bit here and there. But this is what he does, and you're going to see this a lot. This is a little more of a subtle deal to what he does here where he's going with the hands. But look at his hands right here up on the man. He is a master of just beating the hell out of you as the ball is in flight, just about at the time it's going to get to you, and doing it without really being over the line, with it making looking like it's just hand fighting. After all, you look at the receiver, and he's got his hands down there too. The receiver sees that, or the umpire sees that, referee, whatever he is, sees that, and he says, well, they're just both going at it. Can't call it on one when they're both doing it. Might as well let him get through with it. And this is a point, one of the reasons why I call him the, the moment of truth mangler. Because once that ball is in flight, and as it's coming in path, you better believe he's going to have his hands on you. You better believe it's going to get physical. That's just his game. That's the nature of it, I think. Personally, it's because he comes from the background of having two uh, nearby relatives that were safeties. And strong safeties at that. 
which is the more physical of the two, or tends to be the more physical of the two. There again, just coming up violently. Again, see, <laughs> he just he attacks it. And maybe it's just something that stands out to me on film with this, but you watch him here on like a play like this, where he's he's not going for the ball. There's no part of this. Uh, I'll knock the ball out away from you. He's put one hand to the back of a man's neck here and said, "I'm now now watch what I do with this other hand." And that other hand's coming up with force, and yeah, maybe it's going to come around and hit a ball in there, but it's also going to come around and hit a lot of skin too. And he just doesn't have any. It's almost a punch coming in there, and it does knock the ball away. It's uh, the technique works, but it's what makes it unique to him. Again. Coming up well, making the tackle here. That's probably his most flashiest interception that you're going to get on tape. He's got five career interceptions. This is probably his best, uh, where he's running up the field with the man and you know, jumps back and high points the ball. But this is not really what you see on his game as far as his ball skills are concerned, though. Most of the time, he's going to attack the man rather than attack the, the ball. And again, just coming up, Shy Smith. This kid was drafted last draft. Nice sure tackle. We'll be looking at this play in a second. When we look at the Georgia tape. Very instinctive, knows what he's doing. Gets low with that tackle, just a good... Good solid tackler there, and I am going to give that as a real good skill to have now because I think it's going to become more and more beneficial for these corners to be able to do that with the way that offenses are testing things now horizontally as much as they're testing vertically. When he gets low, he's getting you off your feet, no doubt about it. And, and here again, it's, it, you, it's hard to see at first. So we'll run it a couple times. But number one, he comes out the block, and we're going to watch this a little bit, I think, as, as we check out the Georgia tape here again. But he gets a nice little hand up on press. And the hand's always kind of there, but never to the point where it looks egregious. You see that? He's got his hand in there. He's touching him there all the way through the route. But it never gets egregious enough to the point that the referee is going to throw the flag. And I, I think that that still is going to translate into the NFL level for the most part. What you mainly see here in the highlight is what you're going to see a lot with him of, which is that he'll line up and press. And he may, he may give you a little bit of uh, you know, bump there at the start, but more likely he's going to turn and burn it where he's just going to flip his hips, get to running, stay step with step for step with his man with a responsibility a lot of times, which is part of what gravitates me towards him of the playing cover three over the top. Same thing there. Lines up and press, flips his hips and goes. He's not really a back peddler. It's more of I'm going to get into it and I'm going to start running and I'll stay step for step. Here's another nice play too. You know, playing a little bit of a different different play here where he's on off coverage. So you look, he's 10 yards off coverage at the snap. This is a different type of technique than being up in up on press type of look. Now he's got to react to a couple of things. He's got to read the quarterback's eyes, read the man's route, kind of keep. Keep two eyes doing two different things at once, so to speak. And he reacts well. Drives on the ball. That's what you want to see him to do. Because remember with this, this is very easy to look. Oh, yeah, that's a good play. He's just jumped the route, whatever. Remember, though, he's he's got a first responsibility to deep. This is probably a zone coverage across the board. This guy here could be the, 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 you know, the slot guy could be going deep. Or the outside guy could, but he notices the slot guy take a step in, reads it, maybe knows something off of film and watching this team, jumps the route. Quarterback thinks they got an easy completion instead nearly has an interception. <laughs> See, I call him the moment of truth mangler. Is there any other play that you need to understand more? Am I going to go for the ball? No, I'm just going to grab and grab his head, and just hold on and just headlock him for a little bit of time. I'm going to do that instead. 
just I'm gonna hold on to his head. Try to catch you while I'm holding your head with two arms. <laughs> One more time. Ah. <laughs> I love it. That's that that's that uh, Seahawk feisty spirit he's got that makes me gravitate towards this cat. You can see right there. One thing that is missing in his game and watching his tape a little bit, which is this is why I like highlight films, is they can sometimes give you the good and the bad. He's not necessarily a guy that's got the best hands in the world. or the, You know, he can high point it, but it's just... You can see he's, he's fighting his hands when he's catching a football. It's just not a natural catcher. Again, coming up, taking down Devontae Smith. This is the second time we've seen him do that in this highlight. We'll be watching a little bit of Alabama film. Coming up again, making a good play. You can see he just comes up and he's, you know, almost like a linebacker. He's just, there's nothing soft about him or finesse about him, which is something that you do see in corners a lot. Instead with him, he wants to come up and come up and, and cause some harm. I'm going to go sliding back a little off coverage of the snap, then drive back on the ball. This is, again, is this, if you have a guy, uh, you know, and we'll see a little bit of this. This is, of course, Kellen Mond of Texas A&M. We'll be watching a little Kelly, the Texas A&M tape. But you have him here dropping back. His natural momentum is going backwards at the snap. Again, probably has that cover three responsibility here where he first and foremost has to make sure he's protecting the deep half of the field, but instead reads something, recognizes something, and drives on the route. And in driving on the route, this is also what you see as far as a little bit of what's missing with him at times. Because if he's a little more aware of where the ball is and reading a little more of what is happening as far as the throw goes, he might be able to go make take this for a pick six. But he gets sort of locked in on looking on the guy. Still makes a very good play on it. But that's the part where he might get dinged at the NFL level where it's not the, the, the top-end quotient corners because they'll say he doesn't necessarily have... Uh, the the hands to make him that guy here again just comes up high this time look at him just ripping the man down I mean just that's bully ball right there that's bully ball <laughs> nice work you can go low too that's a little of a hawk hawk tackling hawk tackling technique right there. And here again, you see what I'm talking about with the, he he really, if he's got a little better of ball tracking, a little better of just kind of reading the ball in flight, he, he might have a little bit of a better chance of being close to this. But he's just going to, you know, it's the one part, I'm not trying to knock him too hard on it, but it is the one part missing for him a little bit. Part of why he gets so violent, I think, as the ball's about to arrive, as he's going, I, I can't catch it, so I might as well just beat the hell out of you. Okay, so the first bit of film we're going to watch here is going to be the Florida Gators in 2020 playing the Georgia Bulldogs. This pits the number eight Gator team against the number five Bulldog team, and uh, a good challenge for this lot. Uh, now this number one run here off the start is not ran towards our guy and his side. They are running away with from him, which is something that, Georgia did quite a bit of in this game in 2020. And we're not going to be showing a lot of snaps um, because of the fact that, again, running away from him, by the way, here on this play, because of the fact that they're not challenging him much. Um, here's the time they did run to his side. So first two plays, Georgia runs away from him. Big gains the first time that they run towards his direction. The play's stuffed. He doesn't cause the play to get stuffed, but kind of telling uh, initially, so to speak. Now, here again on the next play, and again, I'm just going to hammer this a little bit so that you guys understand why I'm skipping around a little bit on this tape. They're going to run a little bit of a screen play over here or a swing route over here. Sorry, not a screen, but a swing route. And again, running it away from our guy. He's over here to the strong side of the formation. So there's a little bit of we're going to have to go to a bunch of different games here and get little bits and pieces and bites rather than a whole meal because there's not much you can really tell from these games, even though they're really good challenges as far as the competition being really good, just because of these offenses being so scared to kind of go after him. Again, throwing away from his side. He's bottom of the screen. 
So this is just going to happen kind of over and over again. But we're going to skip here in a second to where he does stand out and actually do something. First, though, before we do that, we've got to point to something I'm going to discuss after we go through the video section, and that is business decisions. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Mr. Elam can tackle. Mr. Elam can fight off blocks. Mr. Elam can show a lot of effort. But Kyar uh, Elam also has a few little faults that can show up from time to time, and that is that he's going to make a business decision. And this is making a business decision. See that? Number five comes up in this play after the catch. Tight end, it looks like, is going up the field here. And he doesn't really put the full run into it here. See him hold up there at the end and let him just get into the end zone. Let number two try to make the play instead. Now, maybe he couldn't stop him on this particular play. But there are a couple moments that show up in his game like this. Again, coming up, you, yeah, slows down just a little bit. It comes up just a little bit in his tape. It's not all the time. Just a little bit, worth noting. Um, something that, again, you talk about things that need to be cleaned up in your final year in college before you do declare for the NFL draft. This is something that, that stands out to me with him. He needs to probably clean up a few things technically a little bit, though he's very. I, I think he's fairly polished technically for guys his age, but uh, maybe a little bit of a better effort on the field at times being a little more consistent in that uh, tenaciousness. There's nothing particularly dramatic about this next play I'm going to show you. The quarterback drops the snap. It becomes basically a dead play almost from the jump. But neither Kair, Elam, or the receiver know this. And I think it's interesting because this is basically his signature look throughout the 2020 season. He's going to line up and press. Make that receiver think about him getting his hands on him off the snap. Make that receiver aware of the fact he's got a guy a couple inches bigger than him, 10, 15, 20 pounds heavier than him. And Kair is going to use that to his advantage. But what then happens is sort of the second part of his plan off the snap because he doesn't really very often, at least from the tape I've watched so far, really put his hands that much on the receiver. What he's actually just going to look to do is flip his hips and get to running. It's not much of a backpedal going on here. I'm just going to flip and try to run with you then at the snap. And then he's going to combine that with some very subtle physicality. Here you're going to see it. I'm still going to keep my hands with you and carry you up the field. It's not exactly a press look. He's not trying to shock jam you at the snap. What he's trying to do is just sort of run with you and keep his hands on you as well subtly, almost as if he's adding 5 to 10 pounds onto you. Just sort of, sort of carry you up that field a little bit. Carry up the field. Make it harder for you to get up to full speed as a wide receiver. As I said earlier, I am going to be bouncing around quite a bit in this game, in these games we watch with Mr. Elam, because of the fact that these quarterbacks are just scared to test our guy. They are completely shook. And I'm not going to make you guys watch film after film. I'm just watching a guy not being looked at at all. So it's kind of hard to assess much when it's that case. But we've got enough here we'll get a feel for him. What does happen, though, as a common theme in watching Elam's tape is that he will go quarter after quarter without the quarterback going after him, and then suddenly they will test him. But they're testing him to try to catch him unaware, not really testing him because they're trying to exploit one of his weaknesses. And you're going to see it here. Florida's up by 10 points in this game. Georgia's got 50 seconds remaining on the half. It's third and 10. This is certainly somewhat of a what could be considered almost a long punt in that uh, Georgia definitely knows that there's not a high likelihood you're going to compete a, complete a pass like this, but they're down and they need to put some points on the board, so they're going to try to get a little bit desperate in this situation. Still, our guy Elam, as he is on these type of routes over and over again, is right where he should be. Now, it's a poorly thrown ball. The receiver's never really given any kind of opportunity to do anything here. But the thing to pay attention to and the thing to always continue to pay attention to with Elam is this moment right here. And it's the hard moment to see, of course, because he's running over the scroll that the television's crew puts up in front of you, so you can't really see what's going on to a degree. But I'll run it a couple times so you can notice it. And what you're going to see is this is where the physicality is occurring. Now, he's right about at that line. You can see this purple line being the line of scrimmage. Uh, he's essentially right at that line of scrimmage of, of being just about past that five-yard rule where you can lay your hands on the receiver, but he's going to get away with it because he takes his hand off about right 
here on the 33 yard line or so, he actually kind of lets go and doesn't doesn't touch him. So to the referee, they're going to let that go. He's playing it right on the line. This is a little of that subtlety it brings, though, a little bit of the advanced sort of technique that most of these grabbers don't tend to have. So watch it again here. See, no hands here. He does reach out, gets a little bit of a hand there. Um, but again, it's an overthrow, so you're not going to get a call. But again, just that subtle physicality carrying the receiver up the field and very good with that. It's the part that I just really gravitate towards in his game. Okay, this is going to be one of the last plays we actually run from this Georgia game as Florida kind of gets out ahead here, and uh, I believe right near the end our guy has taken off the field. Uh, this is going to be a play where he actually gets an interception. But what's probably most telling about this play is he's just in the right position. He's not jumping a route. The quarterback throws the ball back behind the receiver. But the thing that jumps out to me is that, again, the quarterback's not testing him until he absolutely has to unless he's got no other choice. We saw it at the end of the half. Third and 10, they're on their side of the field. They need a touchdown already down by 10 points, and here, similar. Third and 10, you're down by now 20 points. And you've got to get yourself a first down here. Well, he finally is going to try out Mr. Elam and see if he can get him. Now the Florida pass rush is getting pretty ferocious here and in his face, so he's kind of falling off his back foot. Bad throw. Elam makes a good play here and in, is in position. But he's not doing anything magical in the route, just in the right place, the right time. I think, if anything, the safety probably helped him out most here by arriving early enough to force the throw back towards Elam as the quarterback was worried about that late driving safety. See, he's just kind of right there on the back side of it. Good play by our guy. Again, you're not tested often when you do get tested and the guy puts the ball in the position for you to pick it off. You better pick it off because you're not going to get a lot of chances to make that happen. So no doubt about it, a good play on his part and a well-played game overall here in this game. Not a lot of flash plays, quite frankly, but just wasn't really tested. Okay, next up, we're going to be taking a look here at Texas A&M. And, uh, again, going to be bouncing about through a bit of tape here. As we saw in the last game, not tested often. We've got, of course, this being the 21st-ranked Texas A&M Aggies coming into this game. Uh, this is, of course, the play that we played a little bit of in his uh, highlight here. As Kellen Mund is not scared to go after anybody. And uh, he went right after our guy Elam here. And Elam let him know, you better be careful. I might jump that route. So this is where he took hold of the tight end's head and held on for dear life. That's why I wanted to pick this game a little bit as we get a little bit of more of a view of uh, getting an NFL prospect-like passer now out here, and maybe these guys are a little more willing to go after it. Uh, Kellen's not much more willing than the Georgia Bulldog quarterback was, but with that said, there's a couple times here I think he gives it a try. All right, Kellamon's going to test our guy down the sideline, a little bit of a fade go route ball. We did see this on his highlight package again. This was the one where there's a little hand fighting going on between him and the bigger receiver. Guy looks about 6'3", 6'4", on the outside, so I think Mon thinks he's got a little bit of a mismatch in the size. But, of course, our guy's 6'2", so he's no uh, midget either over there. But with that said, very well done by our guy. We can't see much here of him carrying him up the field, but at the moment – of truth. He, of course, is laying his hands on you, and he's not going to let you catch it. So, nice job by him in that respect. So, you're a defensive coordinator. You know your corner on one side of the field's not getting attacked. You recognize this, and you tell him, you know what? If the receivers come out in a tight split, meaning that, as you can see on this play, especially at the top of the screen with this wide receiver, he's very close to the line of scrimmage at this point. Just come in on a blitz. Go downhill. Pull the trigger. Because we know the quarterback's first read is going to be to the weak side of the field, weak side of the formation. He's going to be looking away, and there's a good chance the protections aren't going to pick you up, and you're going to have a free run at the quarterback. This turns into being just the case. It's actually a throw into the flat. He's all over it. Uh, but this is, again, a good defensive um, call here to try to get some productivity out of a good player, out of one of your best players on that side of the field, and find a way to generate some of that production for him there. Okay, this play we saw earlier, uh, he jumps on the route. If he's looking at the ball, 
might have himself a pick six, kind of gets concentrated on where the uh, receiver is going a little bit, but nonetheless causes the incompletion. One of the few times Kellen Munn throws at our guy. All right, we're going to show you back-to-back -back plays here. Now, on the first play, the Florida defender who comes up is going to misplay this, uh, basically an old-school read option play, where Kellen Munn's going to come up and he's got the option of the running back on his outside right shoulder, or he can cut the ball upfield. And Kellen Munn's going to cut the ball upfield for a nice little seven, eight-yard gain, but he's able to pull this off because the defender doesn't make a choice between either him or the running back that's on the edge. He sort of gets caught in between for most of the time as he's approaching the play, and it's what causes the big game. You can see here two comes up and sort of, he looks like he's going to go to Mond, but then goes to the running back, and he never really attacks one or the other. Now let's see how our guy plays it. So now they go to this one, and they say, let's see, how, let's see if we can go after Elam in the same way. Again, they're going to attack to the strong side of the formation. Elam's right here at the bottom of your screen. And what he's going to do is he's going to come up here and he's going to take away the running back. He's going to force this to be very quickly on the quarterback to have to run it with no other options on his outside. So watch this. First off, the receiver is supposed to be blocking Elam. Look where Elam is. You see his little head here, his little orange head popping out. He's gotten past already our receiver who's supposed to be blocking him. This is something I've talked about where he's able to get off blocks with ease really nicely. Now he's going to come up on the play. And these guys are coming up, and he's aware of it, I'm sure, from his peripheral of what's going on, where these guys are going to be able to come up and help him out. So he takes, as he should here, the running back, and he cleanly comes up and takes him on. He's up here right now. When that quarterback's coming with the line side, you can't see him here, but he's taking that running back away completely. This now becomes all on the quarterback. Here's the cavalry here in the middle of the screen. And while he doesn't make the tackle on this play, you can see right there he's taken away and forced everything back inside. The running back's literally given up to the point he's trying to come up and block last second now, but it doesn't matter because Elam's also kept his outside leverage. I, I just like this play quite a bit. I'm going to play again just once more um, with the first play. Watch how it's played by the guy coming up. Number two gets confused. Eh. Now watch how he plays it. Comes up, takes away the outside shoulder. Kellen's got nowhere to go. It's a two-yard game. Here on this final drive, Texas A&M is going to go up the football field. This is 38-38, and they're going to hit a field goal and win the game. And much like the most of the rest of this game, they were able to be productive while scheming around Elam, while not going after Elam. They had the moment down early on where they tried to attack him on a little curl route. He was all over it. No chance. They then went down the sideline, a little bit of a fade route with a bigger receiver who in this same game, by the way, was not full on mossing guys, but going over the top of smaller cornerbacks to make plays, and especially down there in the red zone. Well, they did it on him on one play, and he took it right away. He was solid in this game throughout, wasn't tested very often. When, for, when uh, Texas A&M was trying to run the ball in this game, they were mainly trying to run up the middle or away from his side of the football field. There were a couple of moments here where he was loafing it a little bit and maybe perhaps making those business decisions that players will make from time to time. But aside from that, another solid bit of tape against top-level competition. Okay, so we're going to take a look and see what South Carolina has to offer our guy here. This is not as big, I think, a challenge as the first two games that we've watched necessarily, though South Carolina in 2020 had a, a nice little receiver in Shai Smith, kind of a slot specialist guy who did get drafted in this last draft. So a little bit, I don't think he's going to be on him very often, being one guy's on the inside, one guy's on the outside. But with that said, let's see what number five does. Top of your screen right there and see if he gets tested much more than he's been tested here in these first two games, which is not very often. So this is our third game watching Elam play, and he finally, I think, fully now has given up his first real catch. And this is a little bit of a weird technique for him where he's not quite playing off coverage and he's not quite playing press. Got a little bit of no man's land here with what he's doing, and he doesn't seem comfortable throughout the course of this whole route. But it is a beat. Gets turned around, which is never good. Do not want to ever get turned around as a corner. Kind of odd, because he usually is a guy who will turn his hips and start running with the receiver here, but he sort of keeps himself flat and just gets roundly beaten, frankly. There's not much to say about it other than that. Just really sloppy technique on this play. Something you normally don't see him do. 
Well, how about that, folks? We got back-to-back plays where a guy's giving up catches. Here he's playing a little bit of off coverage. It's not going to be a surprise that you're going to give up a catch like that in this situation. You're protecting against the deep ball here or the deep side of the field, so it's going to be easy for a receiver to come out here on a three-yard route and make the catch. Comes up, makes the play, good sure tackle. I'm sure the coach would be uh, patting him on the helmet for that one and by no means saying, what, what were you doing on that play? You're, it's nearly impossible to be protecting the deep half of the field and then at the same time give, give, take away all the short stuff. All right, here we're going to get two plays back-to-back -back, which show off a little bit of his prowess in stopping the run. First off, they're going to run a little bit of this read option, almost kind of a counter back to the weak side of the formation, catching Florida a little bit unaware. It's, again, a nice little call by South Carolina here. And as he comes back, Elam flashes up here and doesn't exactly make the tackle, but what he does is slow down the running back in order to force it back towards his linebacker, who can make then a nice, easy tackle on the play. But good awareness by Elam to feel that ball coming back the other side. This is an instinct-based sort of play. And a lot of, at least my opinion on this play, is he really is what makes this tackle happen and keeps the play from being a bigger gain on South Carolina's part. Next play, getting blocked up by the receiver, gets off the block, gets over, and makes the tackle. Now he's not able to stop the first down. I get that. But he comes up and he makes the play. And while they do get the first down, it's basically you know second and two. So it's hard to kind of fault him for that and understandable. Good play on his part. Okay, and three of the last four plays, showing off his ability to break down, get guys on the ground, be physical. Here we go again. And initially, you've got our guy dropping into that bail coverage, protecting into the end zone. Then he's got to come up and after the short catch, make the tackle. It's, this is where it's, this is a challenging for a cornerback. Your coach, you're telling him first and foremost, you got to take away the receiver going deep. But then if they have an outlet receiver come out of the backfield, you got to come up and make the tackle on that. And it's not going to be an easy tackle like we're seeing here, where running back's got about six, seven yards to do his jukes and spin moves and hops and dead legs and every little move he's got in the book. It's not an easy tackle for a defender coming downhill. But does Elam hesitate? No. He comes at you full force, and he's going to make that tackle time and time again. He rarely whiffs in these type of situations where it's very easy for other cornerbacks to whiff. On this play, we're going to see the same thing happen that happened earlier in this game, being that Elam gets beat on an in-cutting route and, frankly, should probably have given up another completion just like he did earlier on a big gain but the receiver just dropped the ball. What's interesting to note is here again, he is caught in this weird no man's land position that I don't normally see with him on tape. He is neither in press coverage nor playing off coverage, kind of splitting the difference. And you see again that same strange stuttering technique with his feet where he sort of pitter patters a little bit and doesn't choose a direction, gets his hip flipped in the wrong direction, and the receiver easily beats him on the route. Maybe this is just a route that gives him problems, uh, or maybe he just had a weird day with it. Either way, it seems like South Carolina is kind of locked in a little bit on him in this particular game with it. All right, so as I started to cut up this video, I realized I'm getting really long with it, and I know this is probably actually going to be a two-parter and how I'm going to have to post it to the channel, but I did want to include this sequence of plays before we move on here, and the reason being is that this was a sequence of plays that originally is part of what had me kind of going towards Elam in the first place because it stood out to me. You're a cornerback in college. How can you make an impact when the quarterback is completely unwilling to throw your way throughout a football game save for maybe two attempted passes? Well, you do that in tackling. You do that by being a, a force player on the perimeter. And what you're going to see here is over the next four plays, and this is a succession of four plays, is Elam having an impact and causing basically the tackle on all four plays in a row. And I would ask you to go back and watch any college tape of any quarterback in the pros today and find me four plays in the same kind of succession, showing that same kind of physicality, that willingness to tackle, that willingness to fight off blocks. And that's what gets me excited about this guy on top of all he already brings to the coverage game, on top of being violent at the moment of truth, on top of being naturally fluid as an athlete, on top of having that pedigree where you know he knows some of those tricks of the trade. 
So let's watch the succession of plays and see what it is that I like about this most. I think you'll see it right off the shoot. Okay, so on this first play, Elam's not actually going to make the tackle, but in my opinion, he is what basically shuts this play down, and with some of his patented ability to set the edge and always force a running back inside, and if the running back's going to go outside, it's going to be to the running back's detriment. What you notice here is that he's over on the offense's weak side of the formation here, bottom of your screen, and the offense is setting this running play up off the snap to look a little bit like it's going to be a weak side run. But in actuality, it's going to be a counter play. You can see it looks like the linebacker here is signaling it out. Don't know if he's calling that, but Elam is right on top of it. You're going to see him shoot light lightning across the formation here, going lateral. He's quicker than anybody else to read this to the edge. He is, of course, keying up on Shai Smith coming across the formation as somewhat of the de facto lead full black blocker here. But he comes up, lays a nice block on the play, knocks him out of bounds, or at least comes up and helps Zero out here to knock him out of bounds. Well played by Elam. This next play is all about Kair and what he does on it. We've got a couple of pulling guards getting out in space here, but one of them might actually be a center. Anyway, you got a couple of big man mountains moving out in space here to clear the way of the linebackers. This is going to leave Elam having to again fight off the block of the receiver get back into play and make the tackle, which he subsequently does. Nice job, as we've seen on tape, when he's willing to fight off and get back into the play, not give up on it. Lay a nice little hit on the running back as he's coming downhill. Okay, play number three, and again, this is in a row. It's going to look very similar to play number two. He's got the receiver coming off the blocks. He's going to try to lay a block on our man. Gets a little bit of success, but once again, he fights off the block, comes back into this play, and is actually even trying to rip at the ball as he's coming back in to make the tackle. You're seeing these guys all across the board missing tackles on this Florida defense. Our guy Elam is not. Another well-played play, and again, third play in a row. Now on the fourth play, this is the flashiest by far. This is a lot of basically vintage Elam at his best in the running game, and that he shoots up, reads it quickly, takes the ball carrier out from his legs. We've talked about it. This guy's an ACL, MCL killer, man. I don't say it with glee. It's just what it is. He comes up, and he's going to get in there and lay that tackle when his instincts kick in. Those same type of instincts that you wonder if comes from some of that pedigree, having those uh, the father and the uncle who actually did play in the pros. I just like his feel for the game. I'm not going to be surprised in the least if he does take another step forward here this season as he's already shown the elements of an ability to dominate and not just dominate in one aspect of his corner play, but to dominate as a blitzer, dominate as a run defender, and yes, also dominate in coverage. Elam is a Coach Carroll type cornerback. Now, our Seahawks admittedly have never drafted a cornerback as high as he's probably going to go. I'm estimating he's actually going to probably go right around the same place that his uncle went, Matt Elam, which was the 32nd overall pick in the first round. He'll probably be into that neighborhood of things, depending on how he does in his final year. But you can't deny the fact that if he puts in a solid year, that will have been three years of great tape in college at a big-time program with the pedigree he's bringing, which NFL teams absolutely love and, and gravitate towards. He reminds me a little bit of a bigger version of what we saw in Asante Samuel Jr. last year, who also himself came from a pedigree with his father, having played for a couple teams in the NFL and gotten himself quite a sh fair share of interceptions in his time. And it's going to be interesting to track his son's uh, progression this year. As we're getting a lot of these second-generation type players, which we'll, we'll, we'll kind of come to learn if these are something you want to lean towards to or lean away from. But with the tape I see on him, I see nothing that would make me want to lean away from. He is exactly what we're looking for in this Seahawk modern cornerback. He is big. He is physical. I love the, the way he can carry a receiver up the field. And he does it not necessarily with pure speed where he's a 4-4 guy. I mean, he's probably a 4-5 guy at the end of the day, really. But what he's able to do is add subtle weight to the receiver as he's carrying him up his route. So... When you look at college and you look at most cornerbacks in college, they'll do a little bit of what, frankly, Trey Brown was doing last year with Oklahoma, a guy that I do like. But he's going to get real handsy up the football field, and those hands are going to come up high, and they're going to come on the jersey, and you're going to see a lot of pulling away a lot on the film. And the refs in college will let them get away with a little bit more of that than they will in the pros, where it's going to get called much tighter. 
But what you see with Kari Elam and his technique is it's a little bit more subtle to me. It's a little bit more of him adding weight to that receiver as he goes up the field. It's an arm on the side of a shoulder that he's sort of leaning on as he's trying to run step for step with him or a hand on an outside thigh just kind of pressing down a little bit adding that extra five to ten pounds which now suddenly we're even in speed you can't get away from me I'm right there with you all the way it's a subtle technique that I think does translate into the pros a technique that no doubt he probably learned from father uncle and they've passed it down to him, and he's refining it a little bit. And this is what's going to help make me gravitate towards him a little bit. I'm certainly sure this is what would make Coach Carroll gravitate towards him. The, the sealer being his ability to tackle. This guy comes up like a free safety, and he is going to take out his share of ACLs if he continues to tackle like this because he throws his body with reckless abandon at the ball player's knees, and he's taking you out. I mean, he, it's, it's scary to watch at times, quite frankly. But... That's the way the pros want you to tackle now. You can't go up high, so if you're going to come with force, that's where you got to come with force. And he's willing to get down there, get dirty, and go after it. As well as he's equally adept at fighting off blocks. He's very hard to stay blocked. This is going to be very helpful in the bubble screen game at the next level, which is taking more and more hold. It's going to be helpful on the end of rounds, which are likewise are taking more of a hold and are going to test more and more these corners on the outside and how well they can tackle. Elam probably does slide up into the first round of this upcoming draft. If I was to make a guess right now, he's probably going to be picked right along the same place where his uncle was picked at number 32 in the first round overall. He may even vault even higher because we've got we to gotta recognize the fact that he has had now three great years of college production if he can match what he's done in his first two years. And though he did go back from three interceptions in his first freshman year to two interceptions last year, you've got to factor in that there weren't any quarterbacks that were willing to throw his way. He had everyone shook and scared. This is why I had to go through so much tape here with a, a, an assemblage of plays because when you look after game after game with him, you're just seeing nothing but quarterbacks looking away from him the entire time. It was almost funny how you could watch the script play out the same way over and over again where a quarterback would be looking away, constantly attacking the other side of the field or inside, underneath. And then about late in the third quarter, late in, early in the fourth quarter or so, suddenly he drops back to pass and he just he, he hurls a go ball deep to a, right onto his side there. Like they're trying to kind of catch him lulled to sleep a bit or, or unsuspecting because, he, you know, it's three and a half quarters in, you haven't thrown one ball my way, I'm going to get a little sleepy. But he was always there, always ready, step for step, right in the pocket the whole time. He plays with really good intensity. He certainly does have times where he does loaf it, caught him making a business decision on one piece of tape there. I'd like to see a little bit of that more cleaned up as we go forward. But again, he's got another year to refine his tape on this. And what I see in, in the tape he has shown, I certainly would pick him at the back end as it looks like right now at the first round and certainly probably would be in the second round. We'll see how he does this upcoming season, but he's a prospect to definitely get excited about. And he hits the one, two, three, four, five-star mark for Seahawks prototypical corner. That's the Coach Carroll prototypical corner. My name is Brandon. This is Seahawks Scouting. Thank you so much for watching, and please do hit that like button and subscribe if you do like what you're watching. And never forget, don't you ever forget, go Hawks.